in the debate? Is the, is the debate on already? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we are live and the debate is on. The uh, debate is on. The presidential debate is on, but this is the 2020 real estate investor debate. It's a right. lot different and a lot better. Do you have the debate on the TV ahead on, above your head? Yeah, I do. Do you really? Yeah. <laughs> Normally, I mean, like, there's a, like a Lakers game on or something. Uh, yeah, they're not playing tonight. Um, looks like this. It looks like this broadcast. Nobody's on yet, Brian. It looks like this broadcast was deleted on YouTube to stream on YouTube, create a new broadcast, or just remove this destination. The hmm. All right, we got some viewers. We are live. 2020 real estate investor debate. Uh, Brian Schroeder here and Lucas Walls. We are filling in for uh, for Mr. Sam Prim, who is on a West Coast golf trip. That sounds kind of cool, doesn't it, Brian? Yeah, he's, he's like uh, on the course right now, I, I believe. Uh, him and uh, Phil Blackwood are rolling down the links. Hopefully they're having a good, uh, a good round. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, because, you know, he's two hours, what? behind us so we're here central time it's dark they're uh, pacific time i think and they're they're two hours ahead of us just getting off the course and that's why sam wasn't able to jump on today but uh we got some awesome topics and i think sam's going to be on tiktok and uh so if anybody's jumping on from tiktok well welcome if you're on facebook welcome if you're on youtube welcome we're about to get into some uh some debate topics and we're probably not talking health care and um you know coronavirus vaccines we're probably talking single family rentals and uh flipping houses but you never know right single family multi-family self-storage maybe even who knows uh but let, let's hopefully we get a lot of questions today uh, i love questions uh so uh all right so um let's just start real quick with the market update um so Brian and myself, and along with Sam, we we own uh, multiple businesses. You know, we're in the single-family residential real estate investing game. Uh, one of our main businesses is a is a flipping company, and our company buys and sells about 200 houses a year. Uh, so we, on average, do about four deals a week, give or take four or five deals a week, four purchases, four or five sales. And uh, this past week was right on track. Uh, we got four purchases and I think six sales. So a little heavy on the sales. Uh, we sell a lot of houses to real estate investors, a lot of off-market houses at a discount. And um, uh, that shows me that there is still some some confidence out there in the real estate investment world that people are looking for quality rentals. So um, uh, well, what do you think uh, What do you think is attributed to that, Brian? Why, why do you think people are still looking for quality rentals? Why are people looking for quality rentals? Because uh, this is a debate, so this is good. I'm gonna go. Let's do a little back and forth here. So, hi Sam, thanks for joining us. Let's go. Um, so, why are people looking for single family rentals? In part, I think it's because where else are you gonna put your money? Uh, you know, the, you, if you put it in a bank, you're getting like half a one percent, or I don't even know if you get that much. Shit, I don't know what you get. Uh, what's up, Dusty? Um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, tr 10 year treasuries like at less than 1%, uh, you know, uh, the stock market, you know, it's had, it actually had a really good, uh, couple years here actually had a really good string, but gosh, it just feels overvalued. So, uh, I don't know if I'd be real confident putting money in the stock market. So, uh, single family rentals, it's a place to be, you can get a return on your money. What do you think, Lucas? Why are people putting money into single family rentals these days? Why are people buying? Yeah, I, I just think people, you know, it's it's real estate. It's a real asset that you can grab and uh, you can, um, you know, improve the value with your own hands, which is amazing. Um, you can improve the value of a single family rental with putting systems in place and property management efficiencies. It's just uh, and, and while you're doing that, it's putting money in your pocket every single month, cash in your pocket every month and um, you're creating equity. More equity is going to grow every single month as you pay down that note. Um, cause most of our type of properties that we, that we purchase these days do have some leverage on them. So, um, we have some equity up front, but, uh, that's hopefully the least amount of equity we ever have in that property. And then over time we pay down that pay off that note. And, uh, we have a single family rental free and clear at some point. You got a few of those, don't you, Brian? I do. Uh, I actually got 65 right now, which is freaking awesome. That is amazing. And 
You know what uh, else uh, uh, I think people, why people are buying uh, single family rentals right now is interest rates are incredibly low. The lowest I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and I've been around a while. So uh, uh, if you can practically get free money, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but interest rates are super cheap. Uh, so uh, um, it's a great time to buy rentals. I agree with that 100%. I did like this quick analysis on one of our latest rentals, Brian, and the difference between 5% and 4.5% is unbelievable on the cash flow. I think we shoot for like $200 a month and at 5%, this particular property didn't hit that. But at 4.5%, it jumped up $50 and crushed that $200 a month benchmark. So wow. it, it's crazy what a, what a low interest rate will do for your investments that you have. Yeah. And uh, when, it, when I, I don't know, a good share of my investing career, uh, rates were like in the sevens and eights uh, percent. So uh, it's just mind boggling to think that rates are less than four or less than 5% uh, for it'd be tough to cash flow there. It'd be tough to cash flow at seven and eight. <laughs> you know, it was different when we did. Uh, uh, I think that's part of the reason values have gone up so much because interest rates are so low. <laughs> was that back when you were putting your, uh, your rental ad in the classifieds? <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> Crazy how technology changes the brand. People are buying rentals these days. When when I start, first started buying rentals, we had to put an ad to you know to advertise for tenants. We had to put an ad in the you know we're in St. Louis here in the St. Louis Post Dispatch, and we also did it in the the uh, the journal. I, I can't remember what it was called St. Charles Journal or something like that. And I don't remember. It was it was expensive. We we spent like shit. I don't remember, but it it was like. I think it was like a hundred dollars a week or something crazy like that on, on uh, advertising our rentals. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of things go down, you know, in price, but but that's one of them. <laughs> that and flat screen TVs. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, welcome everybody. This is the 2020 real estate investor debate. Uh, Brian's going to put me on the hot seat. We're going to answer a few questions here. But if you have questions on your own, anything real estate investor real estate investing related, whether it be rental, single family, multifamily, storage units, um, uh, flipping houses, um, uh, hard money lending, any questions that you guys have real estate investing related, put them in the chat box and we're going to get to every single question, hopefully, um, and uh, before this thing is over. So uh, uh, first question, I think, if you're ready for it, Brian. Do it. All right. How will your strategy chain as interest rates rise? Is the Burr still the name of the game with rates seven plus percent? I, I'm going to have you answer that question, Brian, just because you were talking about when rates are high, how, how you invested. Well, hi, Shazad. It's good to see you or hear you anyway. Uh, we had a conversation yesterday on the phone and I think we're going to meet up next week. So looking forward to it. Thanks for joining us tonight. So uh, how will your strategy change when rates rise? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, so first of all, I would say I feel fairly confident that rates are going to stay low for a little while. The Fed has been telegraphing that big time that they're they're going to keep rates low for I don't know. I saw some headlines uh, from uh, you know Chair Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, this week uh, that uh, at least through 2023. So that gives us three four years. Uh, where I, rates will probably stay in, in the in the range they're in right now. So I feel like we got some time. But uh, the other thing I would do is I would try to, as long as we're in this lower interest rate environment, try to lock in as many of your, your, your loans for as long as possible. So uh, that's the other thing. So um, try to just take advantage of the market that we're in now uh, and, and lock, lock, lock them in for as long as possible. So you, you don't have to worry about the rates going up, but sooner or later rates will go up and everything will adjust, uh, more than likely. And this isn't always the case, but more than likely as, uh, rates will rise when the economy gets heats up and inflation starts heating up and so forth. And hopefully rents will rise enough that, um, you know, that can take, it can, um, uh, allow for the, the higher interest rates, uh, uh, on rates, but it, it will change the game. There's no doubt about it. Uh, um, but I've been in this business long enough to know that you kind of figure it out as you go. Uh, um, the, uh, you, you gotta, you gotta 
figure out what the rules of the game are and adjust to them accordingly and play the game that it is given you. But uh, the game that uh, we're given right now is low rates. So take advantage of them and lock them in as long as possible. <laughs> Anything to add to that, Lucas? This is a debate. You got the, uh, uh, um, uh, any other suggestions for uh, Shazad? No, not on that one. I feel like we might be running mates, Brian, if we ever ran for office instead of debating each other. But um, on, on that one, no, I'm, I'm right with you. And I, I really don't have anything to add. I think you have the best uh, insight to answer that question. I'm going to move on to the next one here. All right. All right. Jay Hill, what is the best way to find off-market deals? Uh, looking for personal home and rentals. Uh, all deals on the MLS and my market are going over asking price. Uh, same with our market. We're in the St. Louis market. And it's it's the same thing. So yeah, you do got create get creative on finding good deals, and you know, fortunately, uh, not only good in investment deals are found on on the off market, but uh, you know, personal homes are too. I think there's uh, over half of the people in our office right now have found their homes, their personal homes, through off market strategies. So I think that's super cool. So you can find both. Uh, you know, we do a lot of what uh, we call networking and we network and, and build relationships with uh, local wholesalers in the area, local real estate agents, uh, um, maybe local uh, attorneys, local insurance agents that might come across a deal that um, is not fit for the MLS. Maybe it's, it needs some work and it needs some updating. Uh, so we build those relationships, but we also do a little bit of paid advertising. Uh, we do market directly to sellers with direct mail and Facebook ads, but um, uh, we buy about a hundred houses a year just uh, without any money. So I, I would, uh, I would urge you just to go that route, get out there, go to your local meetups, build those relationships with wholesalers, real estate agents, and uh, uh, people in the business to, to, and let them know that, you, that you're a cash buyer and looking for deals. Anything to add to that, Brian? Uh, yeah, pretty much the same thing that you said, uh, but uh, just to, I don't know, hammer it home a little bit, a little bit more is get out in the real estate investment circles. I'm not sure uh, where you're at, RJ, what part of the country you're in, uh, but uh, there's probably, uh, some good real estate investment clubs or Facebook groups uh, that you can plug into uh, at those groups or in those face uh, at those clubs or in those Facebook groups is probably going to be some um, either wholesalers or some uh, real estate agents that are investor friendly real estate agents that uh, uh, and just let them know that you're looking for uh, an off market deal. Uh, and I think that's the best way to go. If, if you're looking for a specific personal home, like a, Back in 1997, Lucas, I bought a house uh, that um, I really wanted to live in this certain part of town. It was basically downtown St. Charles. Uh, um, I, I bought the house that was right across from Byron Mayo Church. Uh, but what I did is I drove around uh, the part of town that I wanted to live in. And there was only like, I'm going to say 50 houses that were like what I was looking for. And I wrote them all down on a piece of paper, kind of like driving for dollars. This was before there was a deal machine app or anything. And I wrote every one of them a personal letter. And I actually uh, found one guy that was uh, kind of getting ready to sell his house and it needed a little bit of work, not, not a ton. Uh, uh, and I was able to get a really good deal on it uh, right where I wanted. So when uh, uh, Jay here talked about uh, his personal home, it just made me think of that. Uh, so uh, do some direct mail, even if it's uh, just in a specific area. Direct mail works. <laughs> Heck yeah. And a reminder to all you guys out there, you are live at the 2020 Real Estate Investor Debate. Uh, Brian and I haven't debated much, but we're about to. One of these questions is going to spark a fire in one of us. So I'm hoping everybody it. votes at the end of this so we kind of know who won the debate. You yeah, know? that's a good idea. We'll have everybody put their notes, uh, put their votes in the chat box. All right. Uh, Foundry Dusty says, did you advertise in the Thrifty Nickel? Uh, I did. <laughs> You're dang right, I did. I advertised more in the Thrifty Nickel to buy houses than to rent houses. But absolutely, I had an ad in the Thrifty Nickel for probably 10 years. It yeah. worked. I remember, the, I remember the Thrifty Nickel. I used to look at uh, used cars when I was like 16 years old in the Thrifty Nickel. <laughs> cool. All right. Jantz says, how does the Burr method work and how often do I refi? So the Burr method stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat. So um, 
not only did I do this on my very first deal, did the same and I do this on our very first deal, which was almost seven years ago at this point, uh, we were doing it on our 120th deal, which is happening this week. So uh, it worked then and it works now and it, it's a great newbie tool, but it's also a great seasoned investor tool as well. So it, it's it's amazing. So um, yeah, so you buy a house at a discount by one of the mes- methods that Brian and I were just talking about. Uh, you fix up that house. Uh, you put a tenant in that house where they're paying you uh, a, a monthly fee every month to, to live in the house. Um, you go to a local bank and they hopefully um, will appraise that house at a much higher value than than what your all-in cost is with your purchase and your rehab. And they'll give you a check for 75 to 80% uh, of the appraised value, but then you'll you'll have a, you know, a mortgage on that house and you'll have to pay monthly mortgage payments. But uh, you'll get to pay off what... Uh, the funds that you use to purchase and rehab the house and you get to go do it again. Um, that's how it works. Um, how often do we refi, uh, on, on the initial burr, we refi, you know, within the first three to six months. And I think that's what you should focus on now, especially as a, as a real estate investor, um, you know, getting that refi as quick as possible. And then, uh, you can worry about long-term bigger portfolio refinances later once you build that up. Anything to add to that, Brian? Uh, uh, I will add one thing uh, that is uh, we have some awesome uh, long uh, uh, much more in-depth videos uh, on our YouTube t- page about the burr method so if you want to get a deep dive into the burr method uh, uh, not only the concept the theory behind it but also uh, uh, real life examples of houses that we've done uh, there's there's several of them on, on, on our YouTube page so uh, uh, check it out. The key is buying it at a discount on the front end. That's the whole key. Uh, if you can buy it a, at a good enough discount on the front end, uh, rehab it well, put a tenant in it, the rent part, go to that refinance it. If you, uh, refin- if you bought it well on the front end, when you refinance it, the goal is to get all of your money back, all or most or all of your money back, which we usually get most, of, usually get all of our money back. Um, that's the goal. And then you can just keep repeating it. So you don't have any of your own money into the deal. <laughs> Love it. Pat says, yo, what you fellas, but I think he made to say, up. Oh, so what's up, Pat? How you doing? Thanks for joining, man. Uh, Kyle, Kyle's got a great question. Uh, this is a great question. Actually, if a tenant moves out, at what point do you decide to cash out and sell instead of a putting new tenant in? Um, that's different for everybody, but man, it's a great question because especially early in your investing career where, where cash is, is maybe a little tight. Um, I, I would say put a number on it, you know, anything over uh, five grand, sell it. Cause you're going to, you can do another bird deal, add another rental to your portfolio for zero and, and, um, you hopefully make money when you sell it. Not only you're not spending five grand, you're hopefully making money when you sell it. So um, that number probably goes up as you um, get a little further in your investing career. Um, I think uh, the number that Sam and I have off the top of my, our head, if, if it's over seven grand on a rental turn, uh, we, we talk about it and figure out if this is a house that we really wanna keep for a long time, then we'll go ahead and put that money in. But if it's maybe one of those um, one of those clunkers that we bought early in the career, we'll just go ahead and sell it as is and uh, make a few bucks and not have to come out of pocket. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, what I what I heard you say, uh, just to say it in a slightly different way, is when the tenant moves out, if there's work to be done on the house, more than five or seven grand worth of work to be done on the house, you guys just sell it, move on to the next one, uh, because you guys got a, pool, uh, a stream of more houses to choose from all the time. Uh, it's, it's fairly easy to just plug in another one. Um, so uh, I think that that makes a lot of sense for me. Uh, for the most part, if a tenant moves out, I, I, I'm trying, you know, I, I'm trying to just really make a really quality long term asset with my portfolio of houses now. So if a tenant moves out, I always look at that house and I ask myself, is this a house I want to own for the rest of my life? If it is, I, uh, I you know, re-rent it and keep that house. And uh, uh, that's that's what I'm trying to do on every house uh, that uh, we have a tenant move out on now. If a tenant mo- moves out and I look at that house, I go, gosh, ah, this, the, the neighborhood's, you know, going, you know, not doing what I wanted to do or, or uh, you know, this house has just kind of been a maintenance headache or whatever. 
I just sell it. So that's kind of my just my deciding factor is uh, is it a house that I want to own the rest of my life? <laughs> yeah. So you don't mind putting 20, 25 grand in it if you know you want to own that house for the rest of your life. Yep. Love it. Love it. OK. So Jason says mailing works. I have used this successfully to find deals for my buyers and I am a realtor and broker. Absolutely. Mailing does work, Jason. Thanks for chiming in there. Put your questions uh, or, or comments in the chat box, guys. We'll get to all of them here. Um, Carrie, uh, I'm new to real estate. I know of a house that will be for sale by owner. How do I know if it's a good deal? Uh, we go, we want to go, we will go see it tomorrow. Uh, this fell in our lap and we are in unfamiliar territory. Brian, go ahead. Knock Carrie's question out. Well, uh, first of all, you gotta, you gotta know, get to know that neighborhood. So if this is a terrier territory, you're unfamiliar with, as in you don't know that neighborhood very well. Uh, gosh, I, I mean, a couple of things you can do. I, I'm assuming, uh, since you're new to real estate, you don't have a real estate license and don't have access to the MLS. So you can kind of look at, you can get a pretty good idea of what houses are worth, uh, using Zillow and, that's primarily what I use. I don't know if you use any other the off off market things, uh, Lucas, uh, like Redfin or anything like that. But try to dial in that area where that house is, like that neighborhood, and go into Zillow and look for houses that have sold within the last year. Uh, or you can look at some of the active listings too. But specifically, try to find the solds and then dial into those and and look at pictures and see how that compares to the house that. Uh, that you're looking at tomorrow, um, you know, if if they're nicer than the house you're looking at, you know, it's probably not worth quite that much. If it if they're not as nice as the one you're looking at tomorrow, it's your house, you know, is probably worth more. So try to find the ones that are most similar to yours and uh, and go from that. If you can't find good uh, information there, um, you know, another thing to do is is to try to bring in a real estate agent that knows that area and, and have them give you some good advice on this one uh, since you're new to real estate. Lucas, what do you got to add to that? Nothing. I'm going to move on to the next one. Well said, Brian. <laughs> I just want to welcome everybody from TikTok. Uh, Sam is out on the West Coast playing some golf with uh, another gentleman, Phil, from our office and uh, another and a group of like eight people. So they're having a good time right now. And he decided to, to skip the live tonight, but he is on TikTok pushing people to our live on YouTube and fa Facebook. So welcome all the TikTok guys. Drop your name, drop your questions in the chat box. Chat box, so we're, uh, we're happy to have you. But you are tuned into the 2020 real estate investor debate. So Brian and I are going head to head sparring practically yelling at each other. Over here, honestly. Uh, I think we're having more fun than Sam and Phil are. Uh, this is a good time. I love talking real estate. Yeah, no, this is fun. So uh, drop your questions and uh, we're going to get to everybody's questions. Okay. So next question, next question. Who do we got here? All right. So when you refi, when you're using the burst strategy, do you claim the refi money towards your income at the end of the year? Um, no, you do not. Um, it's tax-free money because it's technically considered a loan. All right. Anything out of that, Brian? Nope. Yeah. You only have to pay taxes when you sell the house. Uh, you can refinance that and take your money out of it at any time. And that is just a loan. It is not a taxable event. Rachel, can flipping be just as successful as renting out properties? Um, absolutely. Sam, myself and Brian uh, own a flipping business, actually. So um, Brian started his flipping business in 2002, almost 20 years ago where they just bought rehabbed and resold a house. That was their strategy. But um, we use multiple exit strategies nowadays, whether that be wholesaling, still do a lot of rehabbing. Um, we do some uh, just cleaning lists on the MLS and we keep a lot as rentals. So absolutely it can be successful. You know, you got to still just buy at the discount like you would if you were keeping it as a rental to use the burst strategy. Anything to add to that, Brian? I just, I love both. Uh, when I think of flipping, I think it, both, both strategies can be successful as long as you know what you're doing and you get good at it and practice makes perfect. And, you know, study, uh, by being on YouTube sh channels like this. But when I got started, I did flipping buy a house, rehab it, resell it to live on. That was the money that I lived on to pay the bills on a daily basis. And then I, on the, uh, whenever we had extra houses, we would keep them as a rental. And those, that was the long-term uh, cash flow, long-term wealth building strategy. So I, we used both strategies when I first got started and we still do both strategies to this day. We love both strategies. 
Yeah, and, and Vaughn kind of chimed in here. Flipping is fast money and renting is a long-term play. And that, that's another way to say it, absolutely. You said it more succinctly than me. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And then here's Sam chiming in here. Hopefully TikTok peeps are here. Give these guys a shout out if you just came from TikTok. So appreciate it. Jasmine, appreciate it. Uh, Sadie, thanks. Uh, how does one get started? Man, we got a lot of good content on our YouTube channel. So please go visit our YouTube channel and uh, subscribe and share this video. But um, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, channel Sam, myself, and Brian, are, uh, are dropping content at least two or three times a week to, to help newbies and help even seasoned investors uh, get started and keep enrolling. You know, uh, uh, a little while back, uh, Lucas, I, I, I got Netflix. And when I got Netflix, I binge watched uh, Breaking Bad for like a couple months, you know, because I just loved that show. It was so fun and enjoyable. And I think our YouTube channel is just as good, you know, <laughs> like before you to go to bed. Get on the Faster Freedom YouTube channel and watch a video. If you do that for uh, three, four months, uh, or even a month, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna be pretty damn knowledgeable by the end of that. I don't know. Breaking Bad was pretty good, Brian, but uh, I do like real estate. Uh, you know, there's just enough, just as much money to be made in real estate, right? Than meth, I believe. Can I say that on here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got some more qu uh, questions. All right, uh, Kyle, I'm 21 years old, a college student, and I have $4,000 to invest. How do I start, and where can I learn more about real estate investing? Um, we kind of answered the the where I can learn more about real estate investing. Um, there's some great YouTube channels out there, but obviously we're a little biased to the to the Faster Freedom YouTube channel. Um, there's a lot you can if if myself and Sam and Brian had that YouTube channel when we got started, we would have eliminated so many mistakes. So uh, please subscribe and, and watch every single video and you will learn more in those videos than, than most books because it's relative to today's market. Um, and that $4,000, personally, I would just I would just save it for now. Um, keep it in your pocket, keep it in your savings account, don't touch it, um, save it for a rainy day. I really don't like that saying, but um, have, a, have a nice little reserve uh, so when you do start to to invest in real estate, you got a little capital already built up. Brian, yeah. go ahead. I totally agree. Keep the money uh, in your bank right now and uh, invest in yourself by learn, you know, spending the time watching YouTube videos. Podcasts are freaking awesome. So And plug into a real estate club in your city. So whatever city you're in, go to Meetup. Uh, see if there's a real estate investing club that meets there in your city and plug into that community so you get to know people and lucas what what is if you were going to say what are your top two or three podcasts you got uh, recommendations for kyle here man i haven't listened to a podcast in a long time but when i was i started i started getting interested in real estate when i was 22 so real close to your age kyle and um I started listening to Bigger Pockets, and that was my favorite podcast. I listened to every single bigger, bigger Pockets. I forget how many was out at the time, but like one through 120 or something like that at the time. Who knows how many they're out now? Um, I did that, and I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, get my get my mindset right, and then uh, the rest is history. Well said. All right, uh, Colton, what is a typical interest rate for cash out refinance? Um, are you able to amortize over 30 years like usual? Um, uh, if you have the property, if you buy the property, fix it up in your personal name, uh, you can do 10 of those, your first 10. And uh, you're able to do a cash out re refinance uh, and, uh, and and spread that loan over 30 years if it's in your personal name. Um, that type of uh, interest rate is usually lower. So you can do maybe a, a 4.5, 4 to 5 percent, I would say, uh, probably closer to that 4 percent in your personal name for cash out refi. Um, all, all of my deals, all of our rentals, 120 of them are owned by LLCs. So it's a it's a commercial loan, a cash out refi, and we can't get um, 30 years on the, on the Burr method. We normally get 20 to 25. We push really hard for 25, and, and that's what we normally get. And our interest rate is normally about 5% for those. Anything to say add to that, Brian? Nope. You covered it well. <laughs> all right. Foundry Properties. I know this fellow. His name is Dusty. Dusty S. I won't say his last name, but uh, if a tenant moves out of our properties and it's over 7,500 bucks rehab, I'll sell the house. That's a great point. That's that goes back to one of the questions we had earlier. And I think another uh, good question is, you know, if there is too much damage from the tenant, do you sell it as is, 
or do you fix it up a little bit and try to sell it retail? What are your thoughts on that, Brian? Uh, you can do either one. Uh, I've done both. Uh, usually for me, it kind of comes down to, uh, do I have a, a cruise available that can jump on it really quick and is in a, you know, a good part of town? Uh, I'll, you know, if it's like 7,500 or 10,000 or something like that, I'll rehab it, uh, spruce it up and, and retail it. If, if it's for whatever reason, a bigger rehab uh, than that, uh, I'd probably wholesale it. But if it's in that $7,500, $10,000 range, I'd probably spruce it up. Love it. Uh, Jason, Jason says, do you use a template for rehab costs? Uh, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, um, we have a, basically a spreadsheet, uh, that, uh, that we use, uh, and we, we update it regularly, uh, cause from our, our project manager for our, for our, uh, our rehabs. And it's basically just has like kitchen, how much it costs to remodel a whole kitchen, you know, so a typical kitchen in our area, if we're, you know, most of the houses that we rehab are in that like 150 to $250,000 price range. Typical kitchen for us is like eight grand. Uh, uh, that it, so a typical bathrooms like thirty five hundred dollars. You know, flooring is uh, you know uh, about four dollars a square foot, depending on what we're doing. Uh, so we have a we do have a, a spreadsheet that we can just plug in those things based on what that house needs. So uh, that's exactly what we do. We use a template, uh, um, and um, that's exactly right. Anything to yep. add to that? Yeah, in, in our on our spreadsheet has developed over time. We had a pretty basic one when we were first getting started that we just built out because we knew as we started doing our first few houses, we, we, we began to realize what things cost. Uh, and then we just kept tweaking that, kept refining that, and now we got a pretty slick one. Yeah. All right, Gus, I need help with the burr. I have a property, just need funding for it. So nowadays, finding the property is the hard part. And, uh, you know, if you find a good deal, hopefully the money will follow. Um, there's a lot of ways to, to purchase and rehab, uh, an investment property. Uh, my favorite is, uh, find a private lender. So, um, ask all your friends and family if they'd be interested in investing in real estate, uh, in, instead of the stock market, um, hard money lenders, just Google hard money lenders in your market, um, or talk to local banks. So I think that's the three main ways that we use to, to fund the initial purchase of our rehabs. Yeah, and if, if you're new, Gus, which I'm, I'm assuming you might be new, I'm not 100% sure about that, but if you're new, uh, 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 call a couple hard money lenders in your area because they'll help, they'll make that funding on the front end super easy for you and uh, help you walk through that process a little bit. So uh, call, uh, you know, just Google hard money lenders in your city, whatever, whatever city you're in, and I'll tell them you got a property, it's an awesome property, you're excited about it, uh, ask them if they're familiar with the Burr Method. Uh, if they're not, uh, maybe that's not the right lender for you, but uh, um, they can kind of help help you walk through it. <laughs> awesome. Um, this is a good question. This might be where our first debate uh, comes into play here, Brian. So, so remember, this is a 2020 real estate investor debate right here. So uh, got the seasoned vet versus the, uh, the young, savvy, handsome go-getter. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Jay Hill, it, it's a question he asked. He said, keep homes leveraged or pay off as fast as possible. Brian, the floor is yours. Two minutes. <laughs> well, I, I've actually uh, modified my things a little bit here. I still, uh, I all of our houses, I like to either keep them leveraged at 80% or paid off. And the reason I do that is the paid off houses I use for other things like uh, our hard money lending business or lines of credit uh, for rehabs or whatever. So I, I like to work with local banks because it's easy to move money around. And um, I, I like to keep them either leveraged at 80% or paid off. Uh, so if they get in that middle ground, like they're at like a 50% LTV, I'll either, uh, in a, if you know, I got a larger portfolio of them. So if I had several that at that side, I take them back to 80 and pay off one or two. And that's the way I do it. So I kind of do both. I don't know if that, that answers the question, but my overall, I, I used to want to get every one of our houses paid off. Uh, my wife really still wants to do that. Um, but rates are so cheap right now. I, I don't know that that's the right answer. Uh, so I think a little leverage is still good. Yeah. And I think it kind of depends on, you know, what, stage of your investing career that you're in. Um, if you're in the growth mode, I don't think, um, you know, paying them off as fast as possible 
is going to be able to, to help you grow any faster than it would be to, to keep utilizing the burst strategy and locking in these cheap rates. So that's what I would suggest at the moment. Um, uh, currently, if you're in the growth phase and which I am and Brian is more in the stabilized, ma mature portfolio. So uh, I, and I also think it comes back to the, the team you have uh, behind you or, or you want to build um, to to manage these properties. So um, when you think about it this way, uh, similar cash flow could probably be had by 50 paid off rentals uh with uh or 150 leveraged rentals so 50 paid off rentals are a lot easier to manage so a lot of people look at it that way and like why wouldn't i just do that and that's not a wrong way at all to go about it so um i think the point is to to stack those rentals get them get them stacked and then kind of uh, figure out where you want to take them from there all right so how did you overcome fear of answering the phone and running appointments um I don't mean to be too, too brash, George, but uh, you just got to do it. Um, and the more you do it, the, the the more that you'll become comfortable with it. And even if you're not comfortable with it, the more you'll realize how important that part of it is to to finding good deals and uh, to adding quality properties to your investment portfolio or or for you to rehab and resell. Thoughts on that, Brian? Uh, you're exactly right. You just got to take action, and uh, it, it, don't think you're alone, George. Uh, we were all afraid on the on the first uh, shit. I was like, I was afraid for the first hundred houses that I bought. Uh, you know, the appointments that I went on. Uh, um, so uh, you're not alone. Just know that you're not alone. But uh, take action. Uh, you probably got your you know a little voice in your head telling you that they're not going to take your offer or something like that. Get that voice out of your head and just uh, just go for it. Uh, just you know, be genuine. And the other thing I would tell people this, and so I always would tell myself that I'm just here to help people, you know, and if you, if you truly are just in your heart, genuinely are just wanting to help people, that fear will go away. Cause the fear is cause you're trying to convince yourself that you're, uh, you're trying to get a deal or something like that. Don't worry about that. Just, Go try to help people. Yeah, and and, and you genuinely will be uh, once you run a couple leads and see um, the type of sticky situations that some of these people are are, and the smile that they have on on their face when they come to the closing table after you do a couple of those, I, I think your mindset will change a little bit. Totally agree. Elvira says hello. What's up, Elvira? Hello. All right. Kyle also says um, I'm choosing my degree. Uh, is it more lucrative to jump into the finance degree, my current plan, or switch to real estate development and finance degree? Um, you know, I don't think it, it matters. You know, Brian and I both have uh, engineering degrees, <laughs> and, and Sam has a, a marketing degree. So um, we don't do a whole lot with our degrees. But um, what I would say about my degree is, it, you know, it did teach me to learn and teach me to problem solve. So. Um, I, I personally don't think your degree matters too much. What you do outside your degree and, and how you educate yourself and uh, improve yourself, I think, is going to matter the most. Brian. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said there, Lucas. And, and uh, Kyle is trying to decide between a finance degree or a real estate and development finance degree. To me, both of those would be awesome for a real estate investor. So uh, I, I don't think it really matters. Uh, um, if your current plan is to do a finance degree, I'd probably just stick with that. But educate yourself on real estate outside of college because uh, you're going to learn more through podcasts and YouTubes and plug it into your local uh, local real estate clubs than you are going to at college. <laughs> Said. All right, Luke. Love that name, man. Love that name. Keep that up. Uh, <laughs> if you could go back to where you were when you were 17 years old. Uh, what would you have done? Uh, the, what would you have done uh, then to better your real estate in, in, career? Um, you know, when I was 17, honestly, I just I just wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to learn. I wouldn't take it. I was looking to to play basketball and, and have fun. And I think I think that's okay. You know, there's a you know when you when you're a kid at 17, you know, be a kid. And I, I love that you're curious. But, um, you know, man, 
I personally wouldn't have done much because I needed my, I probably wasn't a considered a man. Well, maybe not even still yet, but uh, probably till I was 22 years old, I wasn't really mature enough to, to understand investing and, and be driven enough to, to go out and get it on my own. So that's awesome if you are at 17, um, but personally I needed my, my time to, to mature. Brian. Yeah, I'd agree with that, Lucas. And uh, uh, for me, uh, um, when I think I was 16 or 17, I, uh, there was, I, I played football in high school and I played a lot of sports in high school uh, and just like Lucas. But a, a new coach moved to uh, uh, my hometown when I was a senior in high school. And uh, uh, true story. Uh, we were not that good when I was a senior in high school. We traditionally had, hadn't had a very good football team, but two years after I left, they won the state championship. And it was in large part because this dude was an incredible coach and he helped me gain confidence in myself. Uh, I, uh, he made me a better person. So I would say if you're 17 years old, try to surround yourself with, uh, quality people. Um, whether they're in the real estate business or not, it doesn't really matter. I don't think at 17, but surround yourself with quality people, find some really good mentors, whether that's a football coach, like it was in my case, or, um, I don't know, a, a business mentor, whatever it is for you. Uh, um, but, uh, uh, I, I don't know that, uh, I would have done anything different than what I did. <laughs> yep. You know, I, we kind of are all on this path. You know, we, 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 we come across the obstacles that we do and we overcome them for a reason. So, um, you know, in the obstacles that I came across and I think Brian has come across in his life has has made us the investors and businessmen and, and people we are today. Um, all right. What do we got here? Jonathan, do you have any real estate financing regrets, uh, from a certain property? Uh, yes. You know, Brian and I lost forty thousand dollars on a house that we rehabbed this year. Uh, Sam and I have lost thirty grand on multiple houses. Normally, uh, the regrets that come to my mind are rehabbing mistakes, and it really comes down to houses that we shouldn't have been rehabbing in the first place. Uh, Brian, your thoughts on that, or any other regrets from you? Yeah, I, 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 so. Uh, what you said there, Lucas, they are, they are regrets, but they are from taking action. You know, we, we learn so much by just taking action. So, uh, I always encourage people to take action. Uh, he specifically said real estate financing regrets, and I can't really think of any specific financing regrets uh, from a certain property, but, uh, along the financing uh, area, I would just say, uh, uh, build, you know, this, uh, real estate is a, is a relationship business build relationships with, uh, with people, uh, in the finance area, some, uh, some lenders, whether they're hard money lenders, whether they're private, uh, investors or, or local banks probably wanted to build relationships with all of those. Uh, but, uh, start building relationships and, uh, uh that'll help with the, with every aspect of finance of real estate, including financing. Yeah. And I, I guess a financing mistake that, uh, uh, has, has stressed me out at times is if I have, too many uh, short-term loans out at one time, uh, you know, you got to figure out what you're comfortable with. But, um, you know, short-term loans are loans that you use to purchase and rehab a property and they're usually a much higher interest rate. So when I have too many of those out at one time, too many projects, rehabs going on at one time, uh, that's when I get a little stressed out. And that's probably not a regret, but just something to, to keep in mind. Jason, those are amazingly cheap numbers, $8,000 for a kitchen. Uh, yeah, those are, those are pretty much what they are in our market. And that's a, that's a rental rehab. So most of our rentals are around a thousand square foot. So the kitchens are pretty simple, um, like normally a little L shape or something, but you know, if we're flipping a, a larger house in a more expensive market, it's going to be more than 8,000 bucks. Uh, Kyle, out of all your videos on this channel, is there one that you would recommend to watch first, uh, to learn how to get started? Brian, I'll let you, uh, answer that, but, um, go ahead. <laughs> Sam's the one that should answer that. He's the one that knows all of them. I, uh, I, 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 I guess it just depends on uh, what you're wanting to learn. I don't have a specific one. Uh, th there's, uh, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's one uh, uh, Burr video that's about a 30 minute long that we go pretty in depth on. I can't remember the name of that uh, off the top of my head, uh, 
but uh, so I can't I can't say. See, if Sam was here, he could tell you, but uh, I don't know him well enough uh, off the top of my head. Yeah, there's one uh, almost webinar style that Sam and I do, and it's all on how to find your first uh, property. It could be a rental, it could be a wholesale, or it could be a rehab, and, and it kind of all starts with finding that first deal. And we spend an hour and ten minutes talking about how to do that. So I would re I would recommend that one, but there's there's a lot of other good ones out there. All right, let me get to a couple, few more questions here. We've got about another 15 minutes, guys, so throw in your questions or we'll try to get to as, as many as possible. Colton, so what happens after you have 10 properties in your own name? I know you mentioned LLC. Are there any differences uh, when you're using an LLC versus personal name? Um, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so when we're talking about the 10 properties, uh, in your personal name, you can have 10 properties and uh, the sell those loans to on the secondary market, which is to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Uh, so uh, that's, and that's the best long-term financing you can get as in, it'll be locked in for 30 years at, at, a, at a good interest rate, you know, like around four, four, four and a quarter, something like that. So what, and you got to have those in your personal name, but after you buy it in your personal name, get the house rented uh, or rehab rented and refinance it in your personal name. You can always quit claim it into an LLC after you've gone through that whole process if you want to get them into an LLC. So that's for 10 properties. After your 10 properties, um, yeah, and you want to put them, keep them in an, own in an LLC, you just got to use local banks or private lenders. We primarily use local banks for our, uh, uh, our long-term financing. Uh, uh, you know, we've, like I got 124 properties right now. I did, I did that with every one of those, uh, uh, bought it, uh, in our LLC, um, fixed it up, you know, and, and I just use private funds or, or, or a hard money lender to buy it, uh, bought it in an LLC, fixed it up, uh, rented it, went to a local bank. Uh, and we have, uh, Lucas and I have relations to NCM. We have relationships with the same, we have three local banks that we use. We've built, good relationships with them. And they'll, they'll, you know, if you build a good relationship with a local bank, you can do a lot of houses uh, with them. <laughs> well said, Brian. Chris, do I build my network before buying my first property? Or do I buy and then try to find people? That's a great question. Um, I would say start to build your network and I would call it my team. You know, you're going to have a team. You need a team in place to be able to execute the burst strategy. So, um, I would start putting out your feelers and, and try to build that team before you buy your first property. Yes, but a lot of that team won't take you very seriously until you actually execute on your first property. And after you do that first deal, that first team becomes so much clearer and uh, you just keep pruning that team and making it stronger over time. Totally agree. The, those first five-ish properties are, are when you're really building your team. After that, this whole process gets a lot easier because you've got your team somewhat built. Uh, but yeah, you, you really need that first property to, to help build that team. Love it. JPG said, I thought your name was Lewis. Uh, that's just uh, what Sam calls me. My name is not Lewis. It's uh, Lucas or Luke or Luke Cash. It's not Lewis. I like Luke Cash. That's nice. It, it is. That was my rap name back in the day, Brian. I'll, I'll spit a freestyle for you one of these days. <laughs> Let's do that. I want to hear that. <laughs> All right, Chris, it's very scary starting out because if something bad were to happen, like a roof and furnace go out, I cannot afford those repairs myself. So I would have to have the money available from my lenders. Um, yeah, you know, that is very scary. Um, the way we teach the birth strategy, though, is is hopefully you're bulletproofing that rental on the initial rehab and taking care of a lot of those big ticket items up front. Um, so that's just a fear you're gonna, you're going to have to get over if you want to build a rental portfolio. And I and I know it's hard, and I know that um, it is scary. But um, um, having a roof go out when you have one or two or three properties is is almost detrimental to the cash flow of that business. But when you have 10 or, or 20 or, or, or 120, like we do, it's, um, you know, honestly, it's it's in the budget. So um, so the more rentals that you have, I, to me, it, it lowers the risk because you have more of a maintenance budget. Brian, debate me. Yeah. Only thing I would add is uh, uh, Chris seems uh, uh, a little scared at the moment. So 
one thing to do to take away some of that fear is to just partner with uh, somebody on your first few de first few deals. Partner with somebody that's got uh, either experience in the things that you don't have experience in or, or more experience. Uh, uh, but at some point, you're going to have to get over those fears, uh, whether you do it yourself. Uh, but another way to, to potentially get over those fears is to partner with somebody else that has similar values, mindset, uh, and you feel comfortable partnering with, uh, uh, just to learn, you know, get over those, fe those fears. <laughs> yeah. And you know, a lot of those things that you're talking about, like a roof and a furnace, you know, the, say the roof leaks, so, you know, the decision, the right decision might be to replace it, but decisions we had to make early in our investment career, we didn't have a lot of cash. We would just go try to repair it the best we could because a couple <laughs> hundred bucks at the time was better than five grand for a new roof. So, you know, we had to take that risk on that if that roof is going to leak in the near future and um, uh, just try to limp things along as long as possible okay. until we got some cash to, to do a full replacement. Matt Lauman, I know this cat and I know that family. That's actually my brother-in-law. Um, what tips, uh, what are your tips for setting your rental rate? List at top dollar and hope for the best or list at a competitive rate where you feel confident that the rental will go quickly, tenant, that, that it will get a tenant quickly. Um, I, I'll go first, Brian, on this, but- uh, This is one we might actually have a real debate on. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll see. So uh, in, in general, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn into the flipping business just for a second. So getting, getting a house sold quickly is almost more important than us than getting it sold at, at top dollar. Um, so we like to, so we like to, you know, price it at the top of the market, but also price it at a point where it's going to sell. Uh, and that's the same thing I think with, with your rental rates, uh, especially times I do think you can push the market just a little bit is if it's your first rent of that property. So maybe it's a brand new fresh rehab of the burst strategy and you got the nicest house in the block. Maybe you can push the, the rent a little bit there, but, um, when those houses, you know, you got a more mature portfolio and they start to turn over. Uh, it just gets a little harder to push the rate because, you know, they're not as updated as they once were. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I pretty much agree with you on this one. Uh, and that, that analogy used to the flipping business is perfect because, uh, yeah, in the flipping business, you want to get those houses sold as quick as possible. Uh, so listing it, you know, close to what uh, uh, market is, but maybe slightly below just to get a lot of action on it right away is good. I, I kind of feel the same way about the rentals. Uh, um, I I feel like uh, you and uh, Sam push uh, rates a little bit more than, than Debbie and I do. Um, yeah, so we just, we pretty much go in where, where Zillow's at for the most part, unless we feel like Zillow's high or low. Um, uh, just because of our experience in that area. So, uh, and I don't know, I, I, I always like to get that tenant in there. Um, so I don't think we don't push it as much as, as I think you guys do. Uh, but what we do do is, uh, we raise our rates every year. So in, as, when you're first getting into this business, it feels like it takes forever to get to that first year, but, uh, you know, as long as I've been in this business, I feel like it's coming around all the time. Uh, so every time, you know, and we, we, so we typically would prefer to put it at a rate that's going to rent pretty quickly. So not necessarily top, maybe 50 or, or $75 less than uh, what top, but pretty much we kind of go in where Zillow says, get it rented quick. But when that year comes around, uh, raise it 20 bucks and then raise it 20 bucks the next year. That's, that's kind of our philosophy. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Uh, cause, cause we do, we are at the top of the market a lot of times. And when it comes time for renewal, you know, we, we look at the market, we're like, we, we can't raise it. We're at the top of the market. But, um, and I also think you got to look at where the, where the rental market is, you know, this spring and summer, houses were renting so quickly and you could push the market a little bit, but now, now that we get into, you know, the fall and the winter here of, of a crazy year 2020, you know, I don't think rentals are going to fly off the shelf like they were earlier in the year. Totally agree. Well said. All right. Yates, uh, he's talking about uh, which video to watch to get started in real estate investing and how to buy your first rental video on our uh, YouTube page. Faster Freedoms YouTube page is the one. 
All right, Jacksonville. Is Jacksonville, Florida a good market for Burr, Brian? I know you got a, a real estate. Um, I, I, got a couple, I got a couple of buddies in Jacksonville, uh, and uh, they're they're knocking it out of the park using doing the Burr method. So absolutely, uh, uh, I uh, one of my friends down there in uh, Jacksonville, uh, he's actually doing a lot of new construction doing the Burr method. So he just you can do it with a lot of different things, but uh, he can build a house, uh, buy a lot, build a house. Uh, so new construction uh, using uh, uh, you know private money to do that and then uh, go to a local bank and, and refinance it um, and get all of his money back and do it again. Uh, but so he's doing that with new construction, but he's also doing it with uh, rehab. So uh, you can definitely do that in Jacksonville. Jacksonville is a great market to do the Burr method. <laughs> Brian, a question just popped up and it's for you, man. You ready for it? <laughs> I'm ready. Here it is. Did you watch? I did. Holy smokes, Kyle. I was, that's how I got into real estate investing. I, I was uh, in my apartment, uh, which uh, before I even owned a house and uh, uh, for whatever reason, I couldn't sleep one night and I was up at like midnight or one o'clock. I don't remember what it was. And I watched the entire Carlton Sheets infomercial. <laughs> and bought the system and uh yes uh, i did watch it do i look like carlton sheets or something why do you ask that question oh man that's great maybe you have some of the same philosophy philosophies but that's that's really cool that kyle asked that okay. all right here's here's what chris said um i'm at work right now but i'm so glad i was able to watch a portion of this and sneak some questions in i really appreciate it guys you are awesome and and inspiring so you know that's that's what we try to be. We try to inspire people to create financial freedom for themselves. Uh, and we love s making millionaires out of people. And we know that this strategy, when done right, can do that and, and set your family and yourself up for, for the long term. So appreciate it, Chris. That's the whole goal of this. And we uh, we honestly appreciate everybody else from for jumping on to the 2020 real estate investor debate. Brian and I were going at it toe to toe throwing blows, knockout punch after knockout punch, but uh, it was great. Um, any closing closing thoughts, Brian, to, to the group before we get out of here for tonight? Uh, no, I just really enjoyed doing this. So I appreciate everybody throwing in the questions because uh, this is a lot of fun. So uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I think it was a great debate, Lucas. Uh, um, so let's do it again sometime soon. <laughs> let's do it. All right, guys, see you next Wednesday. 8:30 Central Time. Hopefully Sam will be back and uh, he'll uh, he'll rock it out for you with whoever his guest is. So uh, thanks for watching, Lucas and Brian, and we're gonna we're gonna sign off for the night. See you, everybody. Bye bye.